We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. It's great to see you all here. Just a reminder, as we continue to grow as a church, um, it's a good thing to stop saving a place for your purse and your jacket, right? So we're going we're gonna to keep uh, making room for people as the church continues to expand. Hey, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Matt. I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor, and I hope to maybe meet you after service. So come find me somewhere. I usually hang out in the lobby or a cafe or outside somewhere. I'd love to shake your hand and get to know your name. Hey, have any of you ever been so sick before uh, that, that somebody makes you drink something that you don't want to drink to try to get over it? In my, in my house, we have uh, Melissa, my wife, has this uh, pineapple cough syrup that she makes. And I'm telling you, if you cough like three times in a, in a span of like five minutes, you're going to hear the blender, okay? And it's, gonna, it's not a good thing. And then she's eventually going to come at you with this cup with this stuff in it. And supposedly it sounds good, right? I said the word pineapple. I love pineapple. The first time she was offering it to me, I'm thinking, this is great. You know, pineapple, it's not. <laughs> like it's, whoo, it's like the worst, right? Like oh, my, my daughters and I, if my wife is ever approaching us with one of these, we know like two coughs, you might be all right. But if you get that third cough out, you're going to have to drink this stuff. And it's nasty. It's really, really bad. Um, see her for the recipe. I am. Um, <laughs> But the book of James that we're going to start talking about, uh, we're going to have this series. It's going to go between today and take us all the way through our, our Christmas Eve. We're going to do something else on Christmas Eve, all right? But it's going to be all the way through December. We're going, to, we're going to spend some time in the book of James. We're going to tackle it verse by verse together. And I'm really excited because James is one of my favorite books of the Bible, and it covers this concept of trials, you know, this, this cough syrup. Sometimes God allows certain things to happen to you that don't feel very good, they don't taste very good, but they're ultimately for your benefit. And so one of the things we're going to talk about today is that concept specifically. Before we do, though, James chapter 1, verse 1, gives us a little bit of context. So let's look at that verse together, all right? Open up your copy of God's Word to James. Verse 1 says, this letter is from James a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I am writing to the 12 tribes, the Jewish believers scattered abroad. Greetings. So there's a little bit of context here. A couple of things you should know. We call this the book of James, but it's actually an epistle, right? It's a letter that James was writing. A little bit about James. A couple of fun facts about James. Did you know that James is the half-brother of Jesus? Can you imagine being the brother of Jesus? I mean, talk about having a brother who can do no wrong. I mean, that's a lot to live up to. <laughs> Thinking about the concept of having a brother who's just like perfect in every way, clearly a parent's favorite, right? It's like, oh, I'm Jesus, yeah. Like, well, James has had to deal with this. And the cool thing that we, we also, most Bible scholars believe that James didn't even become a follower of Jesus, until after Jesus' ascension back into heaven. So the whole time Jesus was living this perfect life, this whole ministry, his death, his burial, his resurrection, James was like, uh-uh, uh, no, I'm not following my brother, right? And it was later that James eventually decided that he's going to follow Jesus as the Son of God. And when James went in, James was all in. In fact, they say about James that he had knees like a camel, if you want to understand what that means, if, you've, if you're picturing a camel, they have really like skinny legs, but their knees are like, there's a big ball of, you know, real big knees. Well, James was said to have knees like a camel because of how often he was on his knees in prayer. So when James gave his life to Jesus, he went all in. He was all in. And so James is the one who's writing this letter, and the letter is being written to 
It says the 12 tribes scattered among the, the nations. And what that means is, remember, the 12 tribes of Israel. So he's writing to the Jewish people, but not to Jewish people, but now the Jewish believers. Those who have decided from the Jewish tradition to place their faith in Jesus. Now, we studied last week that if you're in this room and you're a follower of Christ, you've been adopted into the family of Abraham. You're part of this family lineage. And so as James is writing this letter, he's writing it not only to the 12 tribes then, scattered amongst the nations, but he's writing to you. He's writing to you and I. And so we want to look at this letter and figure out what is it that James wants us to know. Let's look at verse 2. Verse 2 says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for, wait, what? Hold on, I, I must have copied this wrong. It says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity. No, it says, for great joy. That's how James opens up this letter. That's his opening statement. Hey, y'all, whenever really cruddy things happen to your life, put a smile on your face and consider it incredible and, and joyous and wonderful. Like, does anybody else want to scratch your head there in the moment? I was looking, I, I wanted to find a, a GIF or a meme that kind of like really, uh, like, anyway, I think this is what, this is how I feel. <laughs> right? Is this the way, this has got to be the way that maybe when you hear something like this, that you're thinking, huh? How in the world am I supposed to take the trial and the trouble and the, 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 the gunk of my life and use it to somehow find joy in it? What is that all about? What is James getting at? Because it doesn't quite make sense. And notice he also doesn't say if trial comes your way. He says when trial comes your way. So there it is. In fact, we see this promise also. Jesus says in John chapter 16, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. This is what I call the worst promise of Scripture. It's a promise in God's Word that's been made to you. Guess what, believer? In this world, you will have many trials and sorrows. It's, it's right there. It's in God's Word. You're going to experience ups and downs. In fact, here's some advice for you. If you are in a season right now of, of mountaintop experience, if you're like, man, everything's going well, my job's going well, everyone's healthy, I'm excited to go into work, and you just got, when people ask you, what can we be praying for you about? You're like, I don't got nothing, man. Things are great. If that's the season you're in right now, here's my advice, all right? Pull off at the first scenic overlook and take some pictures because you are just a tourist going through this season. This is not your home. You don't live here. You're just in this, this for a season. And thank goodness for it. All right? I'm not knocking it. When God gives you seasons of, of incredible blessing, that's awesome. But the truth is the Bible says that you're not going to always be there. You're going to experience some valleys as well. And so when you're in those valleys... The question we ought to ask ourselves is how can pain and suffering be good for us? Why would James offer this advice? Why would James say, I want you to consider it a good thing, a joyous thing, a wonderful thing when you go through trials? And at the end of the day, what we need to do is we need to learn to change our perspective. We all, by default, look at bad situations and think, well, this is crummy. This is not good. I'm not going to find any joy in this. But we need to learn, according to James, how to shift our perspective. It reminds me of a story of a young boy who was always optimistic. It didn't matter. He could be in the worst situation, and he would always be happy and always be uh, hopefully filled, and he was always so optimistic. His parents were actually worried that one day his optimism was going to hurt him. So they, they saw a, a child psychologist and a child psychologist said, listen, what you need to do is you need to take one of their, their biggest hopes, uh, one of the moments of life where they're just so excited, and you just need to crush that dream right in front of them. And so they said, this Christmas, instead of any toys for your son, I just want you to fill his bedroom with horse manure. 
And that way he'll just experience it. Sometimes in life you don't get everything you want. And so Christmas morning comes and they, they, he comes out and there's nothing under the tree. And dad's up there doing some stuff up in his room. And they're like, your presence up in the room. So he goes over and he opens up the door and it's just filled with horse manure. And the little boy gets this huge smile on his face. And they're thinking, what in the world? This is not the result we are expecting. And the little boy goes, with all of this horse poop all over the place, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> and see, the truth is that there's an optimism that each of us, we need to shift. We need to be able to find that silver lining when there's a season of trouble in your life. How do we change the way we think so that we can see it for what God has provided it for, which is a moment to grow and learn and find joy in it? So those are the questions we're going to ask. How can pain and suffering be a good thing for us? Here's the first thing I want you to write down in your notes. Number one, pain helps us discover and, or sorry, develop grit. Pain helps us develop grit. And you might not quite understand what that word means. It's my preferred word for the word endurance. Pain will help you develop endurance. And we understand this, right? Sometimes if you're a runner, you know that you have to push yourself to such a place where you're running farther than you ever have before to a place where it starts to hurt a little bit. And why do you do that? Because now the next time you run, you're going to be able to run further, right? You're going to develop greater endurance. If you're shoveling out in the yard and you do the, all day long, there's maybe a chance if you have hands like mine, right? We're going to develop some blisters and they're going to hurt at the end of the day. Why? Because my hands don't have any endurance, Right? But if I keep going at it and I go on this project for about a month, eventually you're going to look at my hands and there's going to be some calluses built up and my hands are going to be stronger for it. That's one of the benefits of the trial that you are maybe in right now is that God is going to develop in you some endurance and some grit. This is how James puts it in verse 3. He says, For you know that when your faith is tested... Your endurance has a chance to grow. There it is. It's real simple. When your faith is tested, when you go through trials and sorrows and trouble and pain, you're going to have an opportunity to grow more and more grit. I'm experiencing some pain in my life right now with this thing called plantar fasciitis. Anyone ever experienced that before? It's this foot in particular, it's terrible, especially after a Sunday. I'll go home and I'll just be in agonizing pain. It doesn't hurt right now because of adrenaline or something. I don't know, because of Jesus. But, but man, I, the thing I've learned helps is I got to lay in my bed or lay on the ground, right? And I do this stretch where you take this rubber band and I got to get my legs straight and I got to like hold it up. And what it does, it's stretching like my, my calf and my hamstring and this whole, all the muscles in the back of my leg. And somehow by stretching these, I'm putting less pressure on my fascia, which is the part that hurt. It, it, trust me, I don't get it, but it all makes sense, all right? This exercise I have to do, it's like, the, 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 the rule is you got to stretch to the place where it hurts excruciatingly bad and then hold for 20 seconds. Like, why would someone do that? Why would someone choose to endure pain? And ultimately, the reason why is because, well, my leg can only stretch up this much the first time I did it, and the next time I can get here, and before you know it, I have some flexibility and my plantar fasciitis should go away. That's kind of the way pain works. Sometimes... God uses it to help you become more flexible and in less pain in the future as you develop more and more endurance and grit. Paul says the same thing, actually, as, as James. In Romans chapter 5, verse 3 is almost word for word. He says, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. It's almost word for word what James is saying, right? But but Paul goes a little bit further. He says this, and endurance develops strength of character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. So if you're still taking notes, a uh, couple more fill in the blanks for you. Number one, pain helps us develop grit, which in turn develops character, 
which in turn develops faith. You see, grit, that endurance that you're growing and building, it actually helps make you a man and a woman of character. And that character actually helps to develop and strengthen your hope in Jesus and your faith. These things all work together really, really well. So then James goes on in verse 4. He says this, so let it grow. In other words, embrace the trouble. Embrace the sorrow. Let these things happen to you. Let them, let your grit grow. Let your endurance grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. By the way, let me tell you when you're going to get to the place where your endurance is fully developed and where you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Believer, that's going to happen the last valley of your life called death, right? You're going to die, and in that moment, you're going to finally figure out this thing through the the saving work of Jesus on the cross, what it looks like to, to embrace perfection. But until then, boy, do we have a lot of work to do. We all have a lot of growing to do in this area, and so we should look at the, the troubles of our life as opportunities for joy. Why? Because they're going to help us develop grit and endurance. They're going to make us stronger people, men and women of character and men and women of faith. All right. Number two, how can pain and suffering be a good thing for us? Number two, pain helps us develop humility. Pain helps us develop humility. Think about this for a moment. Uh, Maybe some of you need to be told this. Maybe some of your spouses think you need to hear this. You are not perfect. You're not. And when trial happens in your life, when pain happens in your life, when certain things happen to you, it's going to remind you that you are not perfect. You are not irreplaceable. You are not God. You are not all, I mean, all these things, it's going to be a reminder in our lives that ultimately we are not invincible this side of heaven. It's an incredible reminder that we are going to need help. You're going to need help. I remember one place, uh, one time in my life where I thought I was somewhat invincible. I thought I was irreplaceable. I got my first job ever in high school working at a coffee shop. And it was one of those drive through coffee shops where people could just drive past on both sides. Here's the sweet spot of, of this job. My best friend's parents own the place. So that makes me what? Untouchable, right? My best friend's parents. I mean, I spend like every other weekend at this place. How awkward would it be if I got fired from that job? Like, I'm in. I'm shooing. I didn't even have to like, interview for the job. It's like, you want a job? You can work here. Great. So I got this job, right? And the the rules were that you're supposed to work every other Saturday if you're on, you got to do it. And I got two Saturdays off in a row uh, for some reason. And then I said, listen, I need a third Saturday off because I got this water polo tournament that my my high school, my team were playing and I got to be part of it. And I remember my manager was saying, no, you can't. I already gave you two off. I already made an exception. You got to be here this Saturday. And I'm thinking in my head, (laughs) you can't fire me. Well, I went to my water polo tournament, and that was the last time I ever went to Giacomo's, right? I got fired by my best friend's parents, right, calling me on the phone, hey, you don't work here anymore. It was tough, but it was a reminder, right, that I needed to be humbled. I needed to go through this experience to remind myself I'm not irreplaceable. I'm not invincible. And and sometimes we all have those moments of our life where we just have to be told, hey, you're not everything you think you are. And by the way, you need help. Sometimes one of the greatest things about trouble in your life is just that simple reminder that you need other people and you need Jesus. That you don't have what it takes on your own. And it humbles you incredibly. Paul actually says he welcomes trial. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12. He says, that's why... I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults and the hardships and the persecutions and the troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 
What Paul says is when you experience moments of your life where you are at your weakest, what it's going to do is it's going to humble you. And in that humility, you're going to recognize that you need Jesus, that you need his strength, that you need his goodness, that you need his church. Sometimes you just got to ask for help. My, my middle daughter named Madeline, and uh, I surprised her. She was in first service. She didn't know I was going to show this video. But she has a hard time asking for help. And uh, I captured this video many years ago. Uh, we were getting ready for Christmas, and my wife asked her to sing Away in a Manger. And as she's singing, there's a point where it's very clear she needs help. And she starts to ask for it, but changes her mind. Check this out. Stand right there. Michaela, go behind her. No, no, Madeline. Okay, we're having some technical difficulties. Madeline, stand right here again. You're going to sing Away in a Manger. Ready? Hold on, hold on. Ready? One, two, three, go. Away in a manger, no prayer for our bed. The way, I mean, away. Okay, okay, ready? Matt, Michaela, why don't you sing with her? I, I don't need Okay, help. okay, okay, I'll hug. Away in. I don't need help. I sing with her. Okay. Away in a major. No crib. Now, now I don't need help. Okay. Away in a major. No grave for our kids. No. I mean, I need help. Lord Jesus. I don't need help. <laughs> 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 it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Madeline, Madeline. Shh. Hey. Madeline, sweetie, we're not laughing at you. It's okay. Listen. Shh. Okay. How about this? How about we all sing it together? Okay. Huh? You ready, Michaela? Can you help us? No. We'll all. I, I don't. Let's just all <laughs> sing it together. It's okay, Michaela. <clears throat> that video goes on. I cut it for your sake. You know those moments of your life where you know you need some help, and your pride refuses to ask for it. Your pride assumes that you can get through it. Your pride says you're strong enough on your own. You don't need to rely on anybody or anything. And what's great, according to James, about trouble and trial in your life is it's going to develop humility in you. And you're going to get to these places where you know, I need to ask for help and I need to be willing to accept it. See, right after James talks about trials in verses 2 through 4, this is what he says in verse 5. He says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. Here's what James says. When you experience these trials, all you got to do is come to me and ask for some help. I'm going to give it to you. You're going to need some thoughts about what to do and how to handle this and where to go and come to me and ask for wisdom. I'm a very generous God. James says that God is very generous and he's going to give it to you if you ask. You see, it's simply put, we have to learn to humble ourselves and go outside of ourselves to where we can find the answer and ask for help. And that's incredibly humbling. Incredibly humbling. But then we get to this next thing, uh, the next note I want you to write down. How can pain and suffering be a good thing for us? Number three, pain helps us develop confidence. 
Pain helps us develop confidence. Now, some of you may be confused. You're thinking, well, number two says pain helps to develop humility. Well, confidence seems like the opposite of that. Which one are we working on here? Well, I want you to know that you can be humble and confident at the same time. You can have uh, humility and a godly confidence at the same moment, and they don't contradict each other. In fact, think about this. Pride is when you trust in you, a godly biblical humility or a godly biblical confidence is when you know that God is at work in you. See, pride is when you're trusting in you. Confidence, a biblical confidence, is when you're trusting God who's at work in you. So what, what, why do I say that it's going to help you develop confidence? Here's what I mean by this. What happens when you're in a season of struggling, you're in a season of pain and difficulty, you're going to learn where it is to ask for help. Who should I be turning to when I need help? Where should I go? And you're going to develop a confidence for who God is and how he works and what's in his word and what's in his church. All those things, you're going to grow in confidence of those things. Because what James does next is he puts a warning label. Remember, he just told you to ask for help. He says, go to God and ask for wisdom. But then he gives this warning in verse 6. But when you ask him, in other words, when you go to God for help and wisdom, it says, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver. For a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world. And they are unstable in everything they do. You see, the problem here is that sometimes we get to this place of humility where we know we need to ask for help. But God says, when you get to that place, be very careful where you go for help. Because you get help that's going to come from God, and you also are going to sometimes go to the world for help. And that's not going to be a good thing. You have to be careful where you go. I had a, a friend uh, in high school named Mike, and he and I, his family, was going to this lake called Pinecrest Lake, and they invited me to come along. And we rented one, one of those pedal boats, you know, two people. So Mike is on one side, I'm on the other. We pedal ourselves out to the middle of the lake, realize that those things aren't fun at all. They're very painful. Like, don't ever rent one, right? We get about halfway out, and we're thinking, wow, we're exhausted. Let's just rest out here and relax and talk and hang out for a little bit. Before we knew it, we had uh, the, the waves, the current of, of the lake and the wind and everything had pushed us to the opposite side of the lake from where we wanted to be. And that's exactly what's going to happen. The Bible says that when you go to the wrong place for wisdom, when you go to the wrong place for help, you're going to be like uh, uh, something that's just tossed here and fro by the wind, going wherever the wind and the, the waves take you. And so we need to be careful to go where we need to go for advice. I'm reminded of a, a parable. It's not a, it's not a parable you'll find in Scripture, but it's just a, a great story with a biblical meaning. And it, it's a, there's a man, all right, and he's sitting on a fence. And he, he, he knows that there's an option on one side of the fence that he could go to, and there's an option on the other side of the fence. On one side of the fence is, is the side of righteousness, and Jesus is over here on this side of the fence saying to the man, saying to you, listen, why don't you come off of that fence and come over here where I'm providing abundant life. I can provide meaning and purpose and everything that you're longing for, that your heart's looking for, you're going to find on this side of the fence, come and have a relationship with me. Well, on the other side of the fence, you have Satan, right? You have the representative of this world who's, who's shouting out all the lies that this world will tell you. Come over here to this side of the fence. This is where all the fun is. This is where all the, the everything that's going to bring pleasure to your life. You're going to find drugs and sex and money and everything your little heart desires. You're going to find, you're not going to find any of that over there. Come over here on this side of the fence. And so the man is sitting there on the fence and he's got that little, you know, the angel on both sides and he's, he's, uh, well, what is it? And we oftentimes find ourselves as that man sitting on the fence. And you know what our decision is? We look at our options and we say to ourselves, you know what? I'm just going to stay up here on this fence. 
I can enjoy a little bit of what I see over here. This looks great. Every once in a while, I can, be, I can watch this worship service, and I can learn some of this Bible verses, and I can do something, and I can also experience some of this fun over here. I'm just going to stay on the fence. And do you know what happens when we make a decision like that in our lives? Satan snickers at your decision to stay on the fence. You want to know why? Because he owns the fence. It's his territory. The fence is his. And he loves it when people stay on the fence because believe it or not, when you choose the fence, you've chosen, ch chosen a side. You've picked a side when you're on the fence. And so what James is simply saying is, I want you to grow in confidence of knowing where to go when you need help. Get off of the fence. The fence isn't good for you. You're either going to go to the world for advice, you're going to come to God for advice and his word and his people. What are you going to pick? And James wants you to grow in confidence of knowing where to turn when you need godly advice. By the way, if you go to the world for wisdom, it says in Proverbs 13, verse 20, walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. You're going to find yourself in more and more trouble if you keep going to the world for advice. And so what James says is simply put, if anybody needs wisdom, ask God. So the very first thing you want to do if you need wisdom, you need help. As you're growing in confidence of where to turn, the very first thing you want to do is go ask God. Spend time in prayer. Get on your knees and say, God, I need wisdom. I don't want to turn to this world. I don't want to be a, a double-minded man. I don't want, to, you know, I don't want the, the wind to blow me any way it wants. I want to be you know, squarely on your side of the yard. Would you give me wisdom? And then what you do second is you listen. One of the best ways you listen is by spending time in God's word. He's already given you a ton of wisdom and by opening up his word, you can read it for yourself and glean wisdom from it. Another way God often provides wisdom for you is by surrounding, when you're surrounded by the church, brothers and sisters in Christ, people who are also committed to following Jesus and his word, they're a great source of wisdom and counsel. But you got to grow in confidence of where to turn when you're in trouble. And pain will bring you to that. Sometimes the hard way. Sometimes pain is going to, you're going to turn the wrong place and you're going to learn the hard way, but you'll grow in your confidence of where to turn next time for help. Right, number four, this last one actually doesn't come from the book of James, but we're answering the question, why, how can pain and suffering be a good thing for us? So I want to make sure you know number four. Number four is this, pain helps us develop appreciation. Pain helps us develop appreciation. So this one, we're actually going to see Peter and Paul are going to address this one. Peter says in 1 Peter 4, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery troubles you are going through, as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad. There it is again. For these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, so that you will have wonderful joy the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. Again, Peter tells you to expect it, to look forward to it, to, to embrace it because, because of some reason. We'll talk about it in a second. Paul says the same thing in Colossians 1. He says, I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. You know what? Both Paul and Peter are saying is when you're suffering, you actually get a little bit, a little snippet of what it looks like to be suffering, to feel pain of what Jesus did for you on the cross. When you're in a moment of pain, especially I had a, a woman come and ask for, for prayer after last service. And she was saying that the trial that she's in is because someone at work was lying about her. I'm like, do you realize that's exactly what happened to Jesus? The only reason he ended up on the cross is because people were lying about him, saying things about him that weren't true. When those sorts of things happen in your life, you can actually grow in greater appreciation of what Jesus went through on the cross for you. And I promise, whatever trial you're going through, whatever pain you're experiencing, I doubt it compares to being crucified on a cross for something that you didn't do. So you'll grow in greater appreciation of what Jesus went through for you 
when you are experiencing pain and trouble. So what now, God? What do we do with this? And I want to encourage you. Hey, if you're in this room right now and you are in a season of pain, if right now you're going through a trouble, a trial, something that's hard to deal with, I want to I want to, God's asked me to share four things with you. I'm going to say them real quickly, but I just want you to lean forward and hear these things. The first one I want you to know is that it won't last forever. We see in 2 Corinthians 4, we're promised that our sufferings are light and temporary. The season that you're in right now, it's not going to last forever. The second thing I want to encourage you with is this, God is with you. We also see in 2 Corinthians 1, God says that whenever you're in a season of trouble, be encouraged because I am there with you. God is with you. A third thing I wanna encourage you with is this, you have access to a tremendous amount of peace. The Bible says that it's a peace that surpasses understanding. I remember when my uh, when my mom passed away 27 years ago yesterday. I was a high school student. I got called out of my class. I thought my mom was healthy. Our life was normal. We were at a mountaintop experience. Everything's good. And I get called out of class in high school and told that my mom passed away that morning from a heart attack. And I remember driving to our house. My sister Kim was in the car. My older brother, Brian, was in the car. And we got there. My youth pastor, Rick Countryman, you guys got to meet Chris or Rick uh, last summer. Um, he was there to, to wait, waiting for us. And I remember at one point he grabbed onto me a bear hug and he was just holding me really, really tight and just praying this prayer right into my ear saying, God, give Matt peace. Give him so much peace. God, I know he's hurting right now, but would you give him a peace that somehow surpasses understanding in this trial that he's in? And I remember feeling it in that moment, saying, God, I don't like this. The taste of this cough syrup is disgusting, but somehow I can hope that you're doing something for my benefit in this. The last thing I want to encourage you with is that you're going to be better for it. Whatever God has you going through right now, you're going to be a stronger man, a stronger woman because of the trial that God has you going through right now. Like I said, my wife's cough syrup is incredibly painful. It's disgusting. I don't wish it on any of you. But if you're coughing, like my wife loves her family enough that she makes us suffer through it because she wants us to get better. And God operates that way with you. He wants you to get better. So he's gonna allow certain things into your life that don't seem like they taste very good at the moment, but they are for your benefit and for your good. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this letter that James wrote to us. We ask that you'd help us throughout this series to learn from it, that we would be able to handle trial and trouble in a way that honors you, the way that you want us to, that we could actually change our perspective. And in those seasons of, of suffering, we could actually find joy in the process because we know that you're making us stronger people, developing our character, developing our faith, developing our humility, developing our appreciation of you, and ultimately developing our confidence in knowing that we can turn to you for answers. We love you and we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.